Hello, thank you, Eileen. Hello, everyone. Okay, there it is. How are you all? <laughs> um, thanks for the introduction, Eileen. Thanks to the Chicago Humanities Festival for having me. Hi, Mary. Hi, Brandis. How are you? Uh -huh. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, so, I think some of you may have seen the copies of the Chicago Defender. I've got one here. Um, and as I was reading it, I was struck by how bold Robert Abbott was in the 1900s, especially for a black man when almost all the black men were told, you can't be anything, you can't do anything. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I, you know, I, I kept thinking this, you know, over and over again as I'm reading the book, and I'm kind of wondering where did that confidence and that vision come from? Well, one of the things that by him being from the Savannah, Georgia area, what people didn't realize is that his mom married a gentleman who was half German, half black, had went over to Germany, came back, and after. Uh, Mr. Abbott's biological father was no longer there in the picture. His, his mom met this gentleman. They married during an era that, quite honestly, his stepfather could have easily passed for white. And he went ahead and opened a newspaper. And in that newspaper, uh, the Woodson, uh, he went ahead and started learning the whole formula of print. He learned that trade right up front, and he also learned from his stepfather how it was to have a voice, where journalism really made a difference in making sure that you were an extension of that community. He learned that a great deal from his stepfather, but he also learned a trade, and the power of education, and that led him to Hampton University. And at Hampton, he studied a printing trade there, um, and then he still went on to Kent Law School and graduated. Mm -hmm. Why did he go to law school? Well, one of the things that he found was by coming here, let's rewind, he was here for, he didn't intend to stay. He went to the World Exposition in Jackson Park that we know of, the future place of the Obama Presidential Center, but that place was also a, a gumbo mix of everything during that time. You had people from the literary world, you had people from entertainment, you had people from politics, everything happened. But one of the things that really influenced Mr. Abbott was seeing Frederick Douglass speak and Ida B. Wells speak and all these prolific literary greats. At the time, they didn't think they were great but they were making moves. They were like our millennials back then. They weren't, you know, these gray hair iconic figures that we know of. They were young and vibrant and they were standing on their ground and we're talking about top of the 1900s where things were really moving. The first L tracks were being installed. You, it was, everything was vibrant and new. And at some point, by him being a little old country boy from down south in Georgia, he's seeing these key people that he had heard of speak. And from that point on, what he was supposed to do was go back down to help his stepfather. He ended up staying. And in that mode of staying, he became very aware of social injustice, uh, how to be more of, a, uh, more of an advocate for his people by seeing these wonderful voices, W.E.B. Du Bois, you, you name it, they were all there at the World Exposition. And understand as a 22-year-old, 23-year-old, you're going, whoa, this is who I want to be like. And they're vocal about slavery, uh, abolitionists, things that you could not speak publicly down south. This is the first time he's hearing this above the Mason-Dixie line. So that was one of the main reasons why he was influenced to say, you know what, let me learn the law and let me see if I can have a place in black society as a professional. It sounds like he also, you know, between, uh, you know, learning from his stepfather and his stepfather's um, printing work, mm -hmm. and then from hearing from these future icons at such a young age, it sounds like that's where he also kind of learned the power of the pen, you know, yes. and, and using, the wor using your words mm -hmm. to advocate. A absolutely. He 
was, you know, an entrepreneur because he didn't have any other choice. He was struggling. Uh, he didn't spend money on clothes. He didn't spend money on shoes or hats. Or he he really focused on let me see if I can do something that will not only bring in another form of income because that wasn't his big thing. It was about let me go ahead and form this paper. This is what I've been known uh, taught to do, and I didn't know that it would come so naturally. And with the help of his landlady over there off of 33rd and State, where IIT is, before that was, you know, the college campus years ago, you had nothing but buildings and homes up along there. And he was uh, supported by his landlady at the time. You know, I had a, rented a little one room, and she was the one that helped him with the first investment of the Chicago Defender. And it got to the point where he wouldn't even pay himself. He, he would literally, you know, walk all the way downtown, back and forth. Uh, everything that they did was around this landlady's uh, kitchen table. You know, her home was really the headquarters of the first Chicago Defender. And so when you're doing that, you get to know the community. You get to know what's going on, who's who. And it, w it came to the point where he would almost want to quit because they weren't making any money. And let me tell you how deep it was. At one point, he had to pay his printer or else he was going to miss this one week of um, putting the paper out. And so he decided to stop into this speakeasy, as we call it. And at the time, the Jones brothers had... Uh, they were the number one runners of uh, illegal activities before the black community. Policy. <laughs> the Policy Brothers, as we, as we know them, the Jones Brothers. Jones Brothers were also the ones that sold off their piece of business to Al Capone. So before that, I'm just giving you a little history, before that, he goes into the speakeasy, Talk to one of the Jones brothers. Tell him, you know, he didn't mean to tell him that, hey, I need to find some money by tomorrow for the printer or else. While he's talking to him, he said, you know what, I like what you're doing. I like what you're doing for the community. I'm going to go ahead and extend you this gift. Now, at the time, we weren't looking at, oh, my God, he ran numbers. Oh, my God, he had illegal activities. All you know is in the Bronzeville community, you want to make sure that you meet, <laughs> you meet your bills. You're not in the judgment lane. And those were the type of people, along with the preachers, along with the politicians, that really saw what Mr. Abbott was doing as a voice, as a starting voice for the community. He didn't care if you were running numbers, if it was putting money into the community and you found some way of paying a bill or helping someone. That's what it was about. It was about not non-judgment, but at the same time giving that voice to everybody. Didn't no judgment. Giving that voice to everyone. Um, so, and I want to back up a little bit, and then I want to come. Mm -hmm. I want to come back to that um, only because I think this particular point is interesting. You know, he graduates from a law school, but he didn't pursue law as a profession. He was actually discouraged. Why was that? Well. One of his friends, you know, at the time, you know, Chicago was moving and shaking, but it still had layers of its own inner racism, uh, reverse racism. And part of that was colorism. And Mr. Abbott was very dark skinned, um, you know, young man who basically stood out among some of the elitists in the black community that were lighter skin that were of a interracial mix or Creole mix. And at the time, I don't know if any of you all heard of the brown bag method, where some balls or some parties, you weren't allowed in. You had to put your hand next to a brown bag. And if you were darker than that brown bag, a lot of times you didn't gain entry into these events, these certain society programs. And one of his friends jokingly said, hey, man, you're just too dark to be an attorney. And so that even challenged him even more to say, oh, you know what? 
I'm going to go ahead and pursue this. But I'm going to pursue it because of the fact that someone told me that I couldn't. And I think that was one of the reasons why he didn't go ahead and practice it on a regular. He just wanted to prove that he can get it done. Now, the paper is known, of course, for um, widespread dis distribution mm -hmm. um, in the early 19 and mid-1900s, of course, uh, throughout the South, and being like um, a force behind the Great Migration. Um, but I read that initially, Robert Abbott didn't actually um, support the migration of blacks from the South to the North. And then he changed his mind. But why was that? Well, one of the reasons, too, was that he believed in um, black ownership and black empowerment and staying in an area that could allow you to still grow and hold on to the land that you owned. And what was going on was that more and more blacks from the South was leaving some of that land that some did own and they were just leaving it behind because it was too much pressure from a lot of the Jim Crow laws that were putting a lot of strain on many black Southerners. And he felt that if more and more left, they couldn't stand on their ground and stand by the generational wealth of their ancestors before them that left them the land. And so he had more of a stand your ground and fight attitude. But as reports came back, thanks to Ida B. Wells and others of just the lynchings, the incidents of people being dragged out their homes, the institutionalized uh, prisons of people being, especially black males, being grabbed and with no reason being in prison, it was beginning to take its toll. And it was more of, we have no other choice but to welcome a lot of our people from down south and let them know the opportunities that laid right there before them. So it was more of, okay, let me go ahead and see if we can just get this information to them and let them know what's going on here so that they can also share in the prosperity that we're finding because we're, we're losing too many people unnecessarily. I was struck by one of the images um, in the book as I was reading it. Um, there's a picture of Abbott, and he's sitting at the table with a number of his writers, editors, columnists. Um, and the caption beneath the picture describes what is uh, the Defender's Bible. And there are like uh, nine goals. Um, among them, number one, American race prejudice must be destroyed. There are several others. I get to number eight, federal legislation to abolish lynching. Number nine, full enfranchisement of all American citizens. Um, which is a very bold vision in 1921. Um, tell me a little bit, if you can, about how the Defender worked towards these goals in its coverage and in its distribution. Well, one thing was uh, about Mr. Abbott is that he wanted to make sure that people understood not only the law, but the policies that push these, these laws forward and what their rights were. And part of it, too, was living in a community that was becoming overcrowded. I mean, to the point where, you know, we're, we're in a society where it's, everything's redlined. You couldn't go past a certain street, and you couldn't go past whether it was 51st. You couldn't go past, uh, uh, past where, we, where you see a Dan Ryan right before that viaduct where you see the, you know, White Sox Park. That was majority black community. But if you cross under that viaduct, it was all white Bridgeport Irish. These were hidden lines of you know where you're at and you know you can't go beyond that. And the discrimination of housing was very prevalent during that time, all the way up to really the mid-70s. So imagine back then. So what he's saying is, look, we're not talking about integration, we're talking about equal. If we are overcrowding in our area and we have poor housing, we have not the highest quality of education, we don't have as much access to certain things that we're seeing other communities, at least be fair about it. And this is where black entrepreneurship really took off because since no one can go beyond these particular silent lines, you had a lot of self-sufficiency that was going on in the community. So it was 
really the encouragement of understanding what this, what this meant. And when an, a reporter came on staff, knowing what the mission was of the paper so that you never got off track of why you are writing, how you are writing, and who you are writing to. So that's what, and up to when I worked there, we still had those same guidelines. And it's timeless, because even though from 1905, you're speeding up to now, what much has changed, really? So I think that he was ahead of his time. Unfortunately, because there's not, uh, it's changed, but it seems like we're running in place, you still have to apply those guidelines to what your advocacy is in that voice for that particular community. And I think that you know, we, we follow that to this day. Um, some of those writings at the time uh, were also to push the government to desegregate the military. Yes. Um, tell me about the coverage and the work there. Well, that was John Sinstack. And John Sinstack was Robert Abbott's nephew by marriage. And he took him on more like a surrogate son. So he was down there, Mr. Uh, Sinstack, John Sinstack was down in Savannah. He told him from the get-go, you know, if I'm to pay for your education, and this is up into the current generation of Sinstacks, if I'm to pay for your education, it will be at Hampton University. Hampton University at the time, still now historical black college, but it was considered an agricultural college. And he went off to Mr. Abbott's alma mater, got his education, and he was already groomed. Um, Mary Bethune McCook, she personally went to grab him. It was like, no, I want you to go get my nephew, make sure he gets on the train, and come up here and deliver him to me because he's gonna learn this business. And that's exactly what happened. And in that, he started to see uh, and hear the plights of his friends. Because John Sinsteck, you're talking about around World War II, a lot of his friends were going off to fight. And at the time, too, you got a, college students didn't necessarily have to go off. So he didn't go off to college because he was being, he, was in, he, he didn't go off to war because he was in college. And, but a lot of his friends did. And when he started hearing the news about, okay, you know, we're out here fighting, but we don't have the same amenities as our white military counterparts. Um, we're not being treated fairly. They want us to fight, but at the same time, we're being treated like third class citizens here. What do we do? And as the story started coming back, he said, we gotta do something about this. And his outreach to the president, President uh, Roosevelt at the time, kind of fell on deaf ears, you know. And it didn't really happen until President Truman is when they were like, you know what, you have all of, this, all of these military men and women because that was one of the first when black women were entering and acting as nurses in the Red Cross. And they're not getting the same benefits as their white military counterparts. And so he was constantly a advisor to President Truman on this because at the time, President Truman didn't really know too much about race relations. And as the Chicago Defender started raising themselves up as a voice, they became an outreach to the White House. And that's how that influence of desegregating the military and making sure that it was equal rights for black military men and women, and I say equal rights in terms of benefits. Because once you were in it, you still didn't have the same level of rights but you at least could get your benefits in the same vein. And that is contributed to John Sinstack, his nephew. I feel like we can't, um, we can't really talk about the Defender and the Civil Rights Movement and the Defender's work without obviously talking about Emmett Till. Mm -hmm. um, and that, 
you know, crucial and pivotal moment in history, um, but also, you know, for the defender and for the movement. Talk, mm -hmm. if you would, a little bit about um, how the how the paper handled that news and that coverage. Wow. Um, between Ebony and the Chicago Defender, they were the only two publications that Emmett's mom, um, Miss Mobley, would allow to take pictures of the open casket. And it's probably between the two publications, the most sought after photos um, that on the archive side that is still very popular, um, but prolific. And when we think about civil rights, we think, oh, Rosa Parks, you know, she didn't give up her seat. That's what they teach us in school. Oh, she didn't give up her seat? That's when it started, the boycott of Montgomery. No, what it really triggered, even further before that, but this is what triggered it when the mom would not allow them to have a closed casket. And at the time, A.A. A. Rayner Funeral Home was handling the body, and they fought this woman, black men, men in general. No, 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 it wouldn't look good. You know, this, this is not a good look. And this woman stood her ground, and she said, no, I want them to see what they did to my child. And at that point, it was captured, recorded by Ebony and by the Chicago Defender. And even following up, we, you know, we had the photos from when they were at the graveside, when they were at the church, See, what most people see is the actual open casket of Emmett, but what they don't see is the chronological order of what occurred from when they picked up the body to when they put the body in the ground. And both publications recorded that through their photo archives and actual interviews. And that was the change, the constant reporting of that because it was things that black media was reporting that general media was not reporting. And so that's where it became even more prolific to have black media and press because we were getting information, we were giving it to people just in that same order as if we were looking at MSNBC or CNN, but we were reading about it. Um, so John Sangstack, he continued the bold vision that Robert Abbott mm -hmm. laid out. He uh, bought other black newspapers. He took the Defender from a weekly to a daily. He founded the National Negro Publishers Association in 1940. Um, so he did a lot, obviously. But he and his wife, they actually played a really um, an important role in society. Mm -hmm. So like if you're flipping through the book, there are pictures with the Shrivers. They were friends with Lena Horne and Mahalia Jackson. Um, we can name all the literary greats of Chicago who wrote for the pages of the Defender. Um, Tell us a little bit about their role in, in the community, the black community, but mm -hmm. you know, in society as well. Wow, John Sinsack and his wife were wonderful. And what was really um, great about them was that they were just as down to earth. You can see them at any of the key businesses in the community. They were very philanthropic. Um, what he did, what John Sinsack did was he broaden the base of what Mr. Abbott did. He, had, he was a visionary. So the day after his, uh, his uncle, Robert Abbott, passed is when he had brought some of the key black-owned newspapers together. It may have been maybe about 30 of them. And it was the National Newspapers Publishers Association. He felt that as a whole, if we can join together as a co-op, we can get more dollars from advertisers as opposed to struggling and, and, and going for each one of them separately and having to prove ourselves, but consolidate it as, a, as an actual organization. And this was his vision. He told his uncle, I think we need to do this because we're fighting for these dollars and we're competing with, them, with each other. Why not join forces? And each of us are in various cities. So the day after his uncle died, that's when they were brought together. And from that point on, you're talking about maybe 300 newspapers throughout the time, now less than 200. That was his vision. The other vision was 
him and his wife were very instrumental in carrying on the Bud Billiken Parade. Robert Abbott started the Bud Billiken Parade in, I think, 1939, incorporated it in 1948. It is one of the longest running not-for-profit organizations in the black community to this day. We just celebrated 90 years of the Bud Billiken. But John Sinsack and his wife were very instrumental in making sure that children were focused on, students in particular, and awarded them. And so when you have a power couple like that that goes beyond not just the paper itself, but how can we give back to our community? How can we work with other organizations in our community so that they know that they have an accessible voice? That's one of the reasons why he kept it in arm's reach of Bronzeville so that you can walk in and say, hey, I have a story, or I want to go ahead and put my daughter's, you know, cotillion in here, or, you know, I want you all to make sure you come to my son's recital. It was that accessible. And so he wanted people to know that it was for them and not at arm's reach. That comes to in the whole thing about Pullman Porters and how do people know about Chicago? How do they know about Detroit? You gotta understand, it, it was not only a Chicago paper, it was a national paper that was being read in different parts of the country thanks to the Pullman Porters. And, you know, the Pullman Porters were very instrumental because they were sort of like the, uh, they were sort of like the walking uh, newspaper themselves. They knew everything about certain cities. They knew their customers. They, you know, they, they you would hear things and you would know firsthand. But what they understood was what was going on in each of these cities that they would stop in. And it's interesting because my great grandfather was a Pullman porter. And so I, you know, I would hear the stories of how he would basically have to go on. 22-hour shifts. Sometimes they wouldn't even give you a break. And so they would actually, he would retain, Robert Abbott would retain some of these pool importers and say, hey, you want to earn some extra money on the side? And they're like, oh, okay. And they would stop by, make sure they had the paper. And so different points of the route, going down south and going out west and going out east, they would actually throw the paper overboard. And they would give certain cattle calls to that point person that they knew was going to hear them. And it worked like clockwork, right? Because certain cities, especially in Memphis, were already banning the defender. Certain cities in Birmingham, like Birmingham, Montgomery, I mean, it goes throughout that whole book that Eton Mitchell wrote, is that it became a major issue because a lot of white owned I hate to say modern day plantations because they were still in existence even back then. They were being threatened with labor. They were losing a lot of their labor. Who is this Chicago Defender? How are they getting a hold of it? And so people were literally sneaking to read it. And a lot of that had to be, had to give credit to the Pullman Porters and A. Philip Randolph, who became a good friend of Johnston Stack. So, you know, we, we have to, it's, it's, a, it's really a consolidation and conglomerate of everyone working together between the Pullman Porters, between the NAACP, between the Chicago Defender, and then later him buying Michigan Chronicle, Atlanta Journal, uh, Pittsburgh Courier. So we, we see this vision that John Sinstack had. He was truly the early version of um, Rupert Murdoch for the black community. <laughs> Hopefully with better news. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so what, you know, what role would you say or what effect would you say integration had on, on black papers, right? Because now you've got the opportunity for black journalists to get hired at the mainstream papers um, and maybe readership falls a little bit uh, at black papers. What, what happened? Well, part of that too is catching up with technology and um, not catching up fast enough, if that makes sense, where you know, the same issue that general market newspaper were, are being faced with. Um, people are reading it via mobility. You know, they're, they're doing this, they're being notified, they're seeing it through their news feed on Facebook. It's 
that gradual effect of denial. And even up till 10 years ago, when there was still a bit of an opening for those papers to kind of recover, it's still that denial of, you know, no, our customer base, they're going to always have our back. But what happens is that a lot of the customer base are getting older, and they're not, um, they're not going to, they start to look at the options there. They're not going to always subscribe because they got to pay for the postage. They got to make sure that it's delivered on time. Um, sometimes it's delivered on time, sometimes it's not. But then you start looking at the advertisement. Advertisement starts dwindling down. And when you don't have the advertisement, you can't make your payroll. If you can't make your payroll, you got to let go of people. If you have to let go of people, that means that your staff becomes smaller and smaller, and then your infrastructure of having a full editorial staff to get the news becomes very, very blight. And so that is some of the things that we're facing, and then you're turning to just putting really associated press stuff in there, press releases, an occasional you know, feature, because all you want to do is just keep afloat. A and that's what we're seeing some newspapers. Now you have newspapers that are catching up and saying, you know what, this can't be our total revenue stream. So even though you have the editorial, you gotta find other non-traditional ways of making money. And that's where we see more events coming into play and becoming that conduit between corporate America and the black consumer. And so now you have newspapers that are in that position to say, we know our readership. Not only do we know our readership, we connect with them and we can connect you to them on a more uh, social basis. And so that's another avenue that we find more publications that are doing. They're doing special events, they're doing outdoor festivals, they're doing media partnerships and collaborations, they're expanding their capabilities. Because you don't want to totally lose the fact that the trust had been there between that paper and the community. And although general market papers are starting to really zoom in, they've been do zooming in for a while to the African American, even the Latino market, because they know they have a lot of competition too in the digital realm. So then it becomes broader. You see more stories that are about us, targeted towards us, because they need to broaden their base as well. And that's become a thorn in a lot of black media side. Um. The Defender printed its last edition this past summer, mm -hmm. last print edition, it is still distributed digitally. What did that mean to you? I think bittersweet um, as a former employee of the Chicago Defender and one for the last, I think for three and a half years, I probably did 90% of the covers and I came in at a time where it was struggling but we were getting it up the hill and it meant a lot because it wasn't about the money, it was about the legacy and what I grew up on. You know, each and every person, I think past 45, remembers the Defender when it was a daily. I remember my memory of the Defender is spending time with my father every morning before he would take me to school. We had a routine. He would take me to the corner newsstand, buy a copy of the Defender, buy a copy of the Chicago Sun-Times. We would go to the coffee house, sit there, and he would drink his coffee, and I would eat breakfast, and we would talk, and he was so happy to get a copy of the Defender because if you didn't get a Defender before 9 a.m., you may not get a Defender. It would run out. And those memories stuck with me, so when to be a part of that editorial staff, it was really about, wow, I'm part of a alumni of some of the greatest writers on this earth, and I cannot not do it justice. So when you hear about that last publication, I wasn't surprised, because I know a little bit of the inside track, but I was more so disappointed because I felt that the fight should have still been there. I felt that the people before us and before the new owners fought for a reason. They lost for a reason. They sacrificed for a reason. And even 
in that realm, I think that that's what advocating for the community when it comes to you know, being a journalist, and especially in a niche market when you're dealing with whether you're working for a paper that targets a Latino base, whether you're working for a paper that targets a Asian or a Polish base, you give them the news, but you give them the news in a way that connects them. And I feel that as we see more and more papers stop publishing, it gets diluted. You know, the connection sends, tends to get lost in the oblivion. It gets lost in translation a bit. And, um, but thank God we have you know, reporters that look like us that are in those newsrooms at Tribune, at the Sun-Times, at WTTW, and others that will carry that if they are not slapped on the wrist for being too out there, <laughs> you know? And some of them are, but they, they yeah. keep fighting the good fight. Exactly. Um, how do you see, and then I want to come to you all for questions after this as well, because I'm sure you have some excellent ones. Um, but how do you, you know, what is the role? How do you view the role of the black press today? Because I think the role was very clearly defined, you know, 50, 100 years ago. Are we recording? We are. <laughs> <laughs> how much time do you guys have? Yeah. You know, um, it's interesting. I interviewed April Ryan, um, the Black Radio Networks. And she is the white thorn. Correspondent. Yes, she's the, the white press correspondent for the Black Radio Networks. And the president's thorn. I mean, like he hates seeing her stand up. <laughs> and interviewed her because there are a few that are like the April Ryans that will not hold back because it's not expected for you to hold back. And when you start holding back and not asking those tough questions and not posing it in a way that you know that your neighbors will come out the house and say, girl, you know, I heard you on the radio and you was kind of weak, you know, with... Why didn't you ask yeah, him about blah, you blah, was blah, kinda, blah. Yeah, exactly. And you have to take yourself out of that and go, you know what, let me go ahead and do this because if I don't, then I'm not doing a, a service to the people that really are not up close to ask those hard questions. And it's not being, and let me tell you something. One thing too, as a reporter, I don't do the gotcha. I think that's what people, young people think, well, if I can just go ahead and I got you. I try to be very respectful to the person I'm interviewing. I try to be very uh, understanding in their role because you don't want to burn bridges, but at the same time, you want to build those bridges. And so when we're dealing from a, a black press standpoint, um, you don't want to tear people down. I think sometimes that's the role that um, certain publications feel like they have to do in order to get those the clickbait or feel like you know they're not they're not doing enough or it can't be competitive to the mainstream. It has to be an even balance, and sometimes we see that with black press, and some, sometimes we don't. Yeah. I would love to hear your questions. Um, where's Brett? Hey, there he is. Good evening, everyone. Uh, just a couple of guidelines. We'll be circulating a couple of mics, myself and our inspector, Allison. Please speak in the microphone and put your request in the form of a question, and please be brief so we get to as many people as possible. Thanks so much. There we are. Did everybody, did everybody hear that? Because his I'm mic happy to repeat. We'll be circulating two microphones. Uh, please remember to speak into the microphone and push your question in the form of a question and be brief as possible so we can get to as many folks as we can. Show of hands. Thank you very much. Um, in, in 1919, there were terrible race riots in Chicago, and as a result, there was a commission. Uh, to study the race riots, and Robert Abbott served on that commission. What, what was his role? You and I were talking about yeah, this Yeah, back, we were backstage. talking about the, the race riots. His role, and we, we were talking earlier, was that he was asked to be on this commission after the 1919 race riots, which resulted in over 30 deaths uh, and f 500 people being hurt in a lot of structures in the black community burnt down because of a, a young black teenager crossed over at 31st Street Beach into the white area, just crossed over the rope, 
and it resulted in one of the deadliest race riots in history. And because we're talking about 14 years into the existence of the Chicago Defender, it was considered a very, um, very prominent paper, one that black people were reading. And so with Robert Abbott, I think this was a turning point of who he really was in the community. And so they asked him to be a part of this commission along with um, uh, Mr. Rosenwald, who was at the time probably the top ph uh, philanthropist in the city. And this was a way for Mr. Abbott to have an outreach to people in the black community say, okay, the churches, the professional and business community, the schools, the parents, all of the people, calm down. We have to rebuild our community. And that was one of the reasons why they asked Mr. Rab Mr. Abbott to be a part of this commission because at the time, the Chicago Defender was that voice. You know, we didn't have WVON radio station. It was the Chicago Defender. And he was considered a leader at that point to get the word out. And that was part of him being on that commission. I'm glad somebody asked. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Anyone else? Eileen. Young lady in the front. Yeah. Uh, Mary, can you talk about Bronzeville Life a little bit? Yes. Yeah, so Bronzeville Life, uh, Maidi Sinstack Rice is the granddaughter of John Sinstack. And uh, John Sinstack, and along with her father, Robert Sinstack, were the publishers. I think her father took over Tri Defender in the 70s. And he became a very prolific figure in the black arts movement, Robert Sinstack, as well as a photographer. He was sort of like up there with Gordon Parks. And he also, a lot of his pictures you may have seen and didn't know that it was Robert Sinstack, the picture of, of Reverend Jackson walking through the airport reading The Defender when King was assassinated. That was Robert Sinstack's photo. Um, so many wonderful photos, some of which is up here that her father did. And so Maidi has taken over the reins to run the Bub Billiken um, organization, which is under the Chicago Defender Charities. And which in, has been renamed, right? It's the been renamed, yeah, the Robert uh, S. Robert Abbott. Yeah. Abbott Foundation. To, and, and, and the reason why, because we wanted to kind of the diluted the confusion of the Defender paper owning the Bud Billiken Parade. But it really is a tribute to Robert Abbott and her grandfather and her father and what they have done when it, when it comes down to not only black publishing, but American publishing. And so by her being a writer herself and one that was one of the key people to uh, uh, produce Uptown Magazine, she went to New York for about a few, about a decade, came back, started teaching at city colleges, and then they said, hey, we really want you to consider running you know, the family business. And so um, by me not being at the Chicago Defender, but have written so much about her family, she said, I love your writing style. I want to do this, this publication. I feel like it's a continual stance in what our family has done. And I, I said, OK, well, what do you want to name it? And she said, Bronzeville Life. I said, why? Why Bronzeville Life? It's so, it's, and she said, because it's the first stop that African Americans had on their way to spreading out and laying their roots here in Chicago. And she's absolutely right. She gave me an example of Harlem. She's like, Harlem, when you think about Harlem, you don't just look at it as one dimensional. Harlem is about the culture. It's about everything that is about equity and inclusion and diversity, but in a way that gives different shades and cross-generational um, outreach from young to old. And that's what she wanted Bronzeville life to be and brought me on as editor-in-chief. And um, we are, you know, we are celebrating a year and a half <laughs> at right now. And it has become really just another movement of, of profiling uh, wonderful people in business and politics and lifestyle and you know you name it and um, we're just like other publications short staff great on ideas short on bodies uh, but it's really a great tribute from her 
to her family because this is something that she's always wanted to be a part of in her family, but because the circumstances of them selling the paper in 2002, <coughs> this has been really a labor of love for both she and I. I think we had a question in the back also, and then we'll come back up here. Hi. Um, so you talked about this a little bit, but I was wondering um, what has the relationship been like over the years between the Chicago Defender and other um, parts of the black press, so in other cities um, as well? Actually, um, before the new owners or, <laughs> or after, uh, there's two parts to that. Before it was sold in 2002 to the current owners, uh, the Chicago Defender has always been a leader among the other black press. And a leader in the sense of, by what Brandis mentioned earlier, very instrumental and direct with the powers that be to all the key organizations and not looking at any other organization as competition because of the philosophy of, you know, let us share. We are better as a group as opposed to standing alone. And that has been that mantra that John Sinstack and Robert Abbott has always carried even into the next generation of um, the Sinstacks. Now, after 2002, under the new leadership, there, there is still that, that sense of outreach, but it's not as it used to be. And it's not just a Chicago Defender. I think what happens is that all the other newspapers feel like, well, you do you, we'll do me, and we'll come together twice a year at our convention. Hopefully we'll get this money and we can keep it moving. And that can be the demise of whether a newspaper really needs that little push of help from another newspaper. Because not everyone's gonna be in the same boat. You know, Chicago Defender is maybe doing well because of the market that they're in. But then you have this other black owned paper in a Tampa, Florida, that may be struggling a bit. Um, a lot of this too, and we didn't touch base, is because population. You know, the Chicago market, African Americans are moving out of Chicago at a very high pace. And therefore, the decline in the community has taken a toll on readership on some of these publications. Same thing with LA. You know, we have friends, uh, the Senatal is the other big um, black owned newspaper in LA. And, you know, we talk about, well, what's going on with you? And same thing, Miami. You know, there's a really known paper down in Miami, in Amsterdam, in New York. And so everyone's finding that niche, but they're experiencing the same situation of certain black communities in some of these major cities are being gentrified and they're being pushed out, forcing black families and elders to find other ways of living in that city or just moving out altogether, which is making an impact on readership. So these are the things that, you know, social economic, you know, influences that has a domino effect on everybody. So to answer your question, are we still working together? Certain ones are and certain ones aren't. I think we've got time for maybe two more, this gentleman, and then I see you too. Question over here. Oh, great, great conversation. Um, I have a question about the relationship between the Defender and the establishment of white newspapers. Was there one, or was the Defender essentially trying to counter, uh, um, be a counterpoint to the uh, traditional white um, newspapers of the Sun Times, the Trib, and, um, and uh, so forth. Or was there, uh, were they able to counter those, uh, those storylines about the black community? Not Were really. they traditional newspapers? Not, not, not really. Um, in the beginning, he actually designed the masthead on the same uh, style as the Tribune, to the point where the Tribune was mad. They were like, wait a minute, because what he wanted to do was get people uh, 
an opportunity to maybe grab the defender by accident, Oops. thinking they were grabbing the Tribune. That's generally what's going on. Yeah, when someone yeah. So steals so someone's look. Exactly. So he changed the look in the field based upon general market newspapers like the Chicago Defender, I mean, like the Chicago Tribune, because Chicago Tribune was. Uh, had so much information going on. If you ever seen the, the older versions of the paper, it's just everything. Whereas you didn't see that with black owned papers, it was more leaflet based as opposed to you doing this. Like if you've ever seen an old newspaper, it's like massive. And so he started to say, you know what? I want this to be a different kind of newspaper. Let me model it off of the general market newspapers like Chicago Tribune. Difference is, and when you said that they work together, nah, but what they did was as they started seeing the influence and the information and intel that was going on in the black community that they weren't getting as being white owned and white journalists on that team, or you know, at the time it was all male newsrooms, believe it or not, both, <laughs> both sides, it was a majority, black male newsroom for Chicago Defender up until Ethel Payne came, and then you had mostly black, white male uh, newsrooms for a Tribune. And they didn't consider it for a long time to be a real paper. They thought, ah, oh, it's a little leaflet, whatever, until John Stinstack started making headway on a whole different level then it was, oh, okay, we see you. Or when politicians started coming on this side of town and trying to garner votes and going, whoa, okay, so this newspaper is influential and possibly getting me elected. That's when you sort of seeing, okay, we need to pay attention to what's going on. And then they started picking up the paper to see how they can get a jump or get more information because they needed that to, for their own reporting. And it's funny because during the time that I was a defender, I don't think that um, the Tribune or the Sun-Times worked with us whatsoever because they were competing for the same readership, quite honestly. So, I think we've got time for one more. I saw this gentleman over here. Thank you for your talk. Um, Thank you. Was it, in, I, I really enjoyed hearing you talk about the Great Migration mm -hmm. and the role of the paper then. Was it their responsibility to be truthful about some of the things that uh, black people were gonna see when they arrived in Chicago? Because I feel like when they, were in, when they were describing Chicago in the papers, they were trying to get people to come up here for work, but a lot of, what I'm reading now is a lot of people came up here and they saw some things that they weren't expecting. Mm -hmm. So was it their job to kind of say something or be like truthful, like, hey, when you get up here, you're gonna run into Jim Crow laws too. You're gonna run into the, some of the same things you see down there. Did they not want to say those things because they wanted people to come? Well, I think that it's, it's twofold. You know, you have people that advertise with the paper and they needed that, those workers, those laborers. So they're gonna put in there what they want people to, to know about their company and why they need you to come up there so they can get bodies, right? But then you had the other flip side of them reporting about certain, you know, misjustices and brutalities that occurred in the black community. Um, but what garnered even more, I think, was that they reported more about that from down south then they did what was going on up here, which is a great question. So you had to ask yourself, okay, well, did people think that it was gonna be roses and lilies and all of that? I think that um, yes and no, because a lot of people that came up had already had relatives up here. So they were already writing home and letting them know, hey, you may have to stay in here. We, we got about 20 people to one apartment and you know, you, it, it's gonna cost you this to get on a trolley. So people didn't really care because whatever was going on down south, it couldn't be no worse than you walking out your house and having a cross burn on your lawn or having to walk to school and maybe see a body swinging from the branch. These are things that happen on a daily with people down south. And it became 
to the point where you didn't care as long as you were up here. So they, they try to be as balanced, but I think that they reported more about the injustices at the time going on down there because they felt it needed more of a voice because the publications down there could not talk about it. They would get burned and ran out like Ida B. Wells did when she was in Memphis. They ran her out, they, they threatened her. Same thing with the publisher down in Atlanta. They threatened him. I think they pulled him out of his office and killed him. So they acted as a platform for those situations that occurred down south to let people know up here what we have to do to help the people that were still down south. Thank you so much, Mary. Thank <laughs> it's been you. A treat. Please help me thank Mary Datcher.